We're past uh, Jeff's bedtime. <laughs> I've been asleep this whole time. <laughs> That's why he's got that beer over there. <laughs> it's my bottle. <laughs> Rock and roll. Those three words just make sense. For thousands of people, rock and roll music is a soundtrack to their hearts. From the Beatles to Led Zeppelin, Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band to Guns N' Roses, rock and roll bands found a way to speak to us. They sang Somebody to Love in Heartbreak Hotel, Summer of 69, and November Rain playing in a rock and roll band in the last resort. Good Riddance is played at every graduation ceremony, and Enter Sandman is associated with the best baseball closer of all time. Rock and roll music makes us dream. We create garage bands and practice for hours, or play air guitar when celebrating a big moment. We do this because the music makes the hair on the back of our necks stand up. We can relate to it. In some cases, we've even lived it. When the best of both worlds collide, you get to listen to your favorite rock and roll music, but you also get to perform it. That's exactly what happened to a group of Syracuse, New York area musicians. They took their dream of making it big and got on stage while the rest of us watched from the pit below. And they rocked, and they rolled, and they gave it everything they had. Life can throw you curveballs, and while this group of musicians never found mainstream success, they were able to find something better. Through playing the local circuit, they found a commonality. The commonality is a name you might have heard before, and that's the late Tom Petty. And when you find a group of musicians who love the catalog that Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers put out, that's when you get the real magic. You get Hard Promises. As far as Hard Promises goes, there is a story to the start of Hard Promises. Um, uh, so prior to Hard Promises, Gavin and I and John Goodwin, our, our keyboard player, and Todd, Tributaris, uh, so four of us were in another band called Kane. And Kane had been around for uh, in that for 10 years um, at that point. Kevin was there for most of it, not all of it. And... Uh, Todd was there for some of it and not all of it, but John Goodman wasn't in it. What am I saying? So um, we were another classic rock band that was pretty popular in town. Um, and uh, our drummer at the time, Pete Levanti and, and I uh, and Kevin, I think said, you know, we always pick songs and we said, we hadn't done any Petty, Tom Petty in that band. Um, and we said, why don't we do uh, here comes my girl, which is one of my favorites. Um, and we, uh, we learned it and we did it. The gentleman in the band uh, who kind of put the set list together, we noticed that the song wasn't in the set list anymore. It kind of disappeared quietly. So <laughs> when we asked why it disappeared, he said, ah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really like Don Petty. So that was a bit of blasphemy for us. So uh, we, uh, we got a little frustrated with that, and we decided to put a side project together that would play all Tom Petty, and that was Hard Promises. Okay. We're going to need more than the Hard Promises origin story here. Let's go back to the beginning and introduce Hard Promises Kevin Farrell. Well, I'm I'm not the oldest guy in the band, but I'm definitely older than Jeff. <laughs> so, um, so I had uh, a lot of the a lot of the uh, classic rock songs that uh, Hard Promises does now. Uh, I was in bands back in the seventies when those songs actually came out the first oh, time. Very cool. Very cool. So, um, you know, I, I basically started playing guitar when I was 10 years old and that was about 1970. And, uh, I was all Beatles. I was all about the Beatles and stones. Um, and then, you know, then I discovered Eric Clapton from a guitar standpoint and, you know, just kind of dovetailed uh, you know, it, it took off from there. And so I was in um, bands throughout the 70s and 80s, some original bands, uh, some cover bands. So one of the original bands I was in, we were, uh, we would 
traveled that we would drive down to New York City, play at uh, the China Club or the Bitter Ends or uh, CBGBs. We'd play for like 35 minutes and drive back home to Syracuse. And so kind of did the road warrior thing. Back then, the drinking age in colleges, well, the drinking age was 18. It was right during that transition. So there was uh, there was quite a bit of work. If you were in a, in a band, you could play at colleges and universities up and down the East Coast, which is what we did. It was a it was a great time to be in a band. And then, you know, life just kicked in and a real job and wife and kids and all that stuff. So I took a uh, I, I took some time off. And then I first met Jeff when I was asked to join Kane. I, I had. Uh, in the late 90s or 97, I ended up joining uh, Benny Mardonis' band as one of the Hurricanes. Um, and Benny had quite a following around here, central New York. His, his followings were mostly uh, uh, central Ohio, a little bit of Florida, um, and then really big in upstate New York. Uh, so I had played with Benny starting in 97 all the way until uh, the end, which was, uh, you know, Benny passed away in 2020. Uh, and our last gig was probably a year or two before he passed away. So from 90, from 97 to about, uh, 2018, 2019, I had played with Benny and we've done a few tribute shows to him ever since he passed, uh, through Benny, we had, some luck and, and Jeff ended up joining Benny and he can get into his thing, but, you know, we ended up having some really uh, great shows with Benny made some good contacts. We ended up doing a handful of shows with Eddie money, uh, backing up Eddie money. Cause Benny wow. and Eddie money were uh, good friends. Eddie money, baby, hold on two tickets to paradise. Take me home tonight one of the best of the classic rock era. Eddie loved Jeff. Eddie, <laughs> Eddie was... Eddie, a I have a picture Eddie. I can send you of me and Eddie. Uh, I'll yes. Send you Eddie from Soundcheck. Eddie, Eddie was a, a real character, and, and uh, I think we all feel, all of us who got to work with him, everybody in the Hurricanes, I think feels really lucky to have been able to spend a little time with him because he was, he was certainly one of a kind. He was uh, very funny, very funny guy. And... Um, and he, boy, did he know how to put on a show. Even, sure. even when his voice wasn't as strong as it may have been in the past, he knew exactly how to assign uh, vocal parts to other people so that he could entertain. And he did a, he did a tremendous job. Yeah. So again, we learned a lot. I learned a lot from him as well. They say all people are unique. But when it comes to future band teammates, how different can their journeys actually be? Introducing the identical twin, Hard Promises, Jeff Gordon. We're actually identical twins, so everything he just said is true for me as well. Uh, no, um, I uh, pretty you know very very similar. We you know we both grew up here in Central New York. So when I was in middle school, uh, right down the road was ninety um, five X, which was is still a radio station in town, but at the time it was a truly independent radio station, it wasn't owned by some big corporation, and so they could spin whatever they wanted to back in those days, and they pumped out a lot of new rock at the time which was the early 80s and uh from middle school we used to get out of school and we used to go down there and drive the djs crazy because you could literally there was no secretary you literally walked up and banged on the door and they were in the studio telling you to <laughs> shut up and so we would go over there and we just we were just i just remember we were just so passionate about the music back then was was everything to us you know so van halen you know uh uh, was exciting and different and we talk a lot about Brian Adams really became kind of big in this area before he went national um, perhaps because he was from right over the border in Canada but right. um, but they played him a lot these these radio stations could play people you know songs they liked uh, and get you excited about them so we were hearing some really cool, cool music and then I wanted to start to play myself and uh, started actually on bass because my father said I, if I wanted to play an instrument, I had to play in school, in the orchestra or something. So I decided to play bass, and I learned how to play string bass at the same time, just so I could play electric bass. 
and did that right through high school, played mostly bass, picked up guitar along the way, kind of as a side thing. But in any band I was in, I was always playing bass and I wasn't singing. I was kind of singing backups and harmonies only only because I was one of the few kids in middle school and high school who knew how to find a harmony. Um, <laughs> Um, and that's that's the credit my my older sisters who loved great music and loved music so they taught me how to taught me about harmony um, when I was pretty young. Uh, it wasn't until my senior year of high school that I stepped out in front and went to the center and played guitar and do what I do now. I guess pretty much probably pretty much the same way I do it now um, with you know twenty more pounds on me. But the, so that started in, in in high school and then you know continued on through college. I just never real almost pretty much never stopped um just playing some like kevin original stuff in some bands and in some bands covers and just back and forth and back and forth and I had an opportunity uh when i was shortly out of college to uh join a, a guy named joe bonamassa who's a huge blues artist now uh yeah. but at the time he, he's from utica so his his voice hadn't changed yet and they didn't know that he could sing he sings beautifully uh but they didn't know that back then and uh, so my agent in Syracuse called and said they're auditioning for a, a singer for his band to do some touring. And um, I, I went out to Utica and auditioned and got that gig. And so I got to tour with Joey for a while um, down the East Coast and got to open up for, you know, Spin Doctors, Blues Traveler, B.B. King, you know, it was buddy guy. It was a pretty cool little feat, pretty cool experience. A very cool experience, but um, that was fairly short-lived because they decided then that they wanted a Joey to uh, become more of a rock uh, band, and they had all these famous people's kids uh, that they wanted to put into a band, and they called this band Bloodline, but wow, they didn't wow. need me anymore, so that was that. I took a little time off then, like Kevin, and started my, uh, went back to grad school and went to become an, an education and thought I was done with music, but um I actually went through this really weird phase of, I guess it was a depression where I couldn't get off the couch after work. I just lay there, I was really unhappy. I had beautiful wife, beautiful kids, but I couldn't, couldn't function. And it was actually uh, then that I got a call from Lou who started, who was in Kane, who wanted to start Kane. And he said to me, um, do you want to be in a, a band? We're going to do classic rock and we're going to do it right. That's what he told me, I remember. And he said, we're going to use big Marshall amps and we're going to He's a Leslie, a B3 Leslie player. We're going to do all that. And I said, no, Lou, I'm, I'm done with all that. I don't have time. And it was actually my wife who said, I think you need to do this because you're not happy. And I think it's because you don't have music. And um, she was right. So I, so I joined, uh, joined Kane and did that for 10 years. Uh, and then we started this band. And some original stuff along the way. I just put out an original record last year with, with Kevin's help. Kevin's on it a lot. Um, so you can check that out on Spotify uh, or anything, uh, any of those streaming spaces. Uh, so I got back into writing original music again, which was really fun. And as Kevin mentioned, I was lucky enough to uh, kind of jump in at the tail end of uh, Benny Mardonis' career. And I don't know if people know who Benny Mardonis is, but Benny Mardonis is most famous for his song, Into the Night, which was a huge hit in, the, in 1980, I believe. Um, and then again, later in the 80s, it, it hit again. So it was kind of unusual that it got in the top 40 twice. So it was fun to, even though it was towards the tail end of his career and he certainly wasn't at, at his prime, so to speak, but uh, he was so, so loved by, by his fans. And he was uh, a really, uh, at the time I knew him, he was a, an exceedingly gentle soul and very nice and very kind and uh, actually taught me a lot and taught me a lot how to, how to show the audience how much you care and love them. So something I, we try to bring to our shows as well. Come back for you, no matter what it takes. Can't live my life without you one more day No matter what you do We're gonna see this through I'm coming back for you Mainstream success. Is it a shot in the dark? Is it really what all rock and roll bands are after? Do you have to forsake it all? Or is there more to a career in music? I would bet that for both of us, I can't speak for Kevin, but I kind of feel like, no, I know him well enough that I have a feeling that there was this, I, I, there seems like there's this time period in your life when you're in your early twenties. And uh, I know for me and I, I, I would bet for Kevin, you know, there was a time when we both were really gunning for, in, in bands that were gunning for that anyway. And, 
you know, it's it's a shot in the dark. I think everybody knew that. But, you know, writing original music, trying to get exposure, Kevin going to New York, you know, there was a reason for those trips. It was hopefully somebody would would see them. And uh, yeah. in the mayor, I was in a band called Free at Last, which we did a lot of original music. And we talked to a lot of A&R people and did did that whole thing. And, you know, so I think, yeah, there, there is that point. But then there's also that point where you start to realize that um, if it doesn't happen, then what? And what what are you losing? If you don't get it and and i really honestly don't know whether or not you know the people who make it always tell you it's it's because they just persevered but i would imagine there's a whole bunch of other people who persevered and still didn't make it and sure. uh so i think i think kevin and i probably were similar and that we kind of made a conscious decision at some point that what we would be giving up by continuing to try that hard might not be worth it uh to to, to lose and in our cases, I think, and we're going to get a lot of brownie points for that, but in our cases, I think it was our wives um, and the opportunity to have kind of a family and a life and a, some kind of steady, secure life. With And now that we have children, I think with the exception of certain days, we are both really glad with that decision. Um, so I can't speak for Kevin, but I have a feeling just knowing Kevin that we, we kind of had a very similar trajectory there too as well. Yeah, and then once that's right. done, you kind of get to a point where you don't do it or you do it less. And then you realize that, well, maybe, maybe I thought I was doing it for that, but maybe I was really doing it for all the right reasons that I really was doing it because I loved the camaraderie of the people I worked with and the musicians I got to play with. And I really loved the challenge of trying to be the best I could at it and the joy that it brought other people uh, and still does. And I, for me, that's, there was some kind of revelation in there. And I think it was when I got off the couch and my wife got me off the couch that I realized that it doesn't have to be that kind of life. You don't have to have a multi-platinum selling records. You don't have to be on tour all the time to gain that kind of enjoyment out of music. And it can be a lifelong thing. So for me, that was kind of a, an aha moment, if you will, that I, I didn't have to, it was an all or nothing, you know, it wasn't an all sure. or nothing. Was yeah. That was, that was the same for me. I, you know, I, I obviously going down in New York city, I was in an original bands and you know we were we were trying to make it and we did that for probably two or three years at least wow and at, at the time and this is probably in the uh, mid 80s and and there was there was quite a bit of the, the music industry had mutated it was was really dynamic and mutating and uh, things were changing from uh, the decade prior from the way the music business was a decade prior. So, you know, at that time I was in my mid twenties and uh, as, as I was getting older, I would, you know, the responsibilities start, you know, uh, accumulating and you feel a little more tied down. Not that I regret it, but um, it was just the, the allure of, you know, I, I remember the last gig we did in New York city in this band I was in, we were driving home in the van. And uh, before we left to come home, there was a guy down there that had been scoping us out. He wanted, he wanted to put us into a development deal. Um, and a development deal at the time meant, you know, you basically uh, you you hold yourself up in a studio, you write songs and you, you're holed up in the studio uh, during the off hours um, he promised us, uh, studio time, you know, it'd be the middle of the night, you know, but we'd have to forsake everything to all as a band. We were a four piece at the time and had to forsake everything and move down to New York city. And at the time my wife was pregnant with twins, our first, and, and I had a, I had a decent job, um, so it was just, uh, it was too little too late for me. And I had lost a lot of the drive that I had had, you know, four or five years earlier. And it was harder to make a living as a musician, because as I said, the, uh, a lot of the, the entertainment venues and the dynamics and the colleges you could play, it was, you, you weren't going to make as much money as you had in the years prior, because the, the jobs just, you know, you, you weren't going to play in front of thousands of kids at a, at a uh, 120 keg event at a university because those things didn't exist anymore. 
because the drinking age had changed. So a lot of stuff had changed at the time, including the ability to make money playing music if you weren't signed to anybody. So I just kind of, you know, for me, um, I just kind of petered out and turned the page and started another chapter in my life. Even after reality sets in, most of us have that moment where we want to give what we're working toward one final shot. Kevin and Jeff are no different. But was leaving central New York and moving permanently to New York or Los Angeles ever seriously in the cards? The guy that we were dealing with wanted us all to quit our jobs, move down to New York, to New York City. And that's the way it was done, you know. Um, but it, uh, it just didn't, that, at that point in my life, it just didn't appeal to me. I was really lucky. The band I was in uh, in the early 90s was uh, an original project. And two of the guys owned a studio in Syracuse, or an actually a really great studio in Syracuse. Um, and so the, the, the studio time was always free, which was great. Um, and I actually lived upstairs. Uh, and it was a pretty disgusting place, so much so that my now wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, wouldn't go there to visit me. I had to go visit her. Um, <laughs> So we had the good news is we could we could make great demos, but uh, same thing you know we had to we had to get out of here to 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 play. We got a little help when I was working with Joe Bonamassa, their management company signed us for a year, and so they pushed us out to Buffalo, Rochester, Albany with plans to go other places. But um, but then I when I when I made the decision to uh, to go back to school. It's funny when you're that age, you think you're really old, you know, and you get 25 or you're like, oh, my God, I'm 25. It's over. My shot is over. And not until you realize that most of these guys who get signed and are like older than you think they are. Um, and they're, they're 31 and 33. And um, and if I had known that, I probably would have tried it a little longer. But I just felt like, oh, my God, I'm so old. She's going to leave me. You know, I'm going to be I'm going to be living in my parents' basement for the rest of my life. Kicked off that I didn't make it, you know, and just be frustrated. So I find something else that I like to do. And for me, it was, I always liked working with kids. So I went back to become a teacher. And when I was doing that, I was actually in grad school. The band hadn't played and we had kind of split up um, when I made the decision to go to school. And it was literally right in the middle of my program when I got a call from the guitar player who said, uh, there's a guy, I forget, I don't even remember what label it was. It was one of the major labels and he's an A&R guy and he wants to meet us in New York. Yeah, we have to go down to New York. And I remember that because I didn't know what to do. Um, and I actually called uh, a gentleman by the name of Dave Razek, who was a pretty well-known, very well-known agent in central New York. Uh, and I asked him for advice. I said, what do I do? You know, do I literally possibly drop out of my program, my graduate program and go down? Should I just go meet with this guy? And, and should I not meet with them? And, and same thing. I said, they're, and he said, you know, chances are that they're going to, if they're going to offer you something, they're going to offer you a development deal, just like Kevin said. And if they offer you a development deal, for most bands, that's the end of the line. So it's very few bands who get the opportunity to do a development deal. And then after the development deal, there's very few bands who get to the first actual album. And there's almost no bands in, in comparison to the number of bands who get to the second album. He said, so when you think of it that way, you'd be taking a massive, massive risk. And the chances are really good that after the development deal is over, you're just going to be right back in Syracuse sitting around trying to figure out what your next move is. So sure. uh, I made the, I took his advice and I, I didn't, I didn't even go down for the meeting. And I think I lost a couple of friends in the band uh, because of that decision. But I, I had to do the, I had to do the right thing for, I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't take that path at that time. It just, it just wasn't working. And so we've reached the proverbial fork in the road. The mind has been made up for better or for worse these gentlemen have decided to build roots in central New York. And while they aren't completely giving up on their musical aspirations, it will take a back seat in comparison to a full-time career. But something interesting happens when you stop looking for what you think you want. In life, we call these moments inexplicable. And Jeff and Kevin never gave up on creating something special with their music. They kept rocking, and one idea led to another. Eventually, a man from Gainesville, Florida, popped into their heads. His name was Tom Petty. You may have heard a couple of his tunes with his band, The Heartbreakers. Tom Petty and The Heartbreakers are one of the most inspiring and prolific bands of all time. 
so it made sense to create a band to honor the music of legends. And it began ever so innocently. That was a pretty easy decision. It wasn't like we sat down and said, we want to do a tribute band and let's figure out which tribute band to do. It was really started with us loving the song that we were doing in Kane and one of the guys not and not letting us play Tom Petty. So we, we really genuinely loved and appreciated Tom Petty first and foremost, I think. I don't think I sound exactly like Tom Petty and I, um, you know, I don't try to imitate him because uh, I have too much respect for him to do that. I think, you know, one of the things we like about Tom Petty is some people see him as a character, but I don't, he wasn't a character. He was just a really great singer songwriter. Yeah. Um, and the band was tremendous. So that was really the main driving force. But then you look at it from another angle and this is what Kevin says all the time. He's absolutely right. Is, you know, how many, how many musicians uh, and bands span four decades of yeah. having uh, music on the radio, new music on the radio for four right. decades. So his musical catalog is so huge that it's endless for us to be challenged and try to learn new material of his. We've still, all these years later, have not gotten to complete the list that we wrote many years ago. Um, yeah. We still, we can't get to the bottom of that list, you know? When I first was in a, started playing, uh, well, in the 70s, that's not when I first started playing, but, you know, so Petty came out in the 70s and I was learning Tom Petty songs. At one point I was in a cover band in the 70s. We were learning American Girl and, and uh, Damn the Torpedoes came out. And then, you know, fast forward 40 years. Uh, and, and when Hard Promises formed, Tom Petty was still very much alive, still very much putting out new music. Uh, H Hard Promises formed, I think, in 2012. And you know, Mojo, the, the, the album Mojo hadn't come out yet. Um, so he just had this career that just spans my lifetime and our lifetimes what better you know we and we all love the music it was it, it just you know it resonated with all of us it's not like we had to be virtuosos to play the music and we definitely decided we weren't going to uh, go down the road of trying to dress up like tom petty and you know <laughs> sew up sew a wig into a hat which <laughs> tribute bands do you know tom petty tribute bands do and and uh, put the fake dreadlocks on a fat old balding guy like myself, you know, you know, we, we just love the music and that's why we play Tom Petty music. It's, it's just, I, I, I listen to it all day, every day still, you know, on the Sirius XM, I just put yeah. that station on and I, there's new stuff I discover all the time. Just and we really like a lot of the live, a lot of the live stuff really gets us going. And so that Tom Petty station on XM is awesome. And we, you know, in the middle of the day, we call each other and are like, I just heard a really cool version of this. And we learned it from another live version, but we got to go check this one out because that is really cool. Because yeah. he changed it every tour. He changed an ending or he changed a, a, a format. It was just, it was just really, he was really a true musician, you know, and I don't, I don't think anybody uh, can ever take that away from him. And as Kevin said, you know, we, he's talking about sewing wigs on. It's we we uh, we actually do know some bands, and you know that's their thing. That's cool. We're not a, we're not you know knocking them. It's just that we when we talked about it, we were like, you know, we'd like to think that we're musicians, and we just love Tom Petty, and we want to play Tom Petty music for other people who love Tom Petty, and that's it. If you want to see a, a wax museum show, you know, or a, a hologram, you know, there's all those things out there. Or you want to go see someone dress up because that's what you need from the concert. Then there are bands for that, too. But uh, that's not who we are. We're not trying to be them. I don't try to talk like them. I don't I don't really study his mannerisms or anything like those bands do. I just sure. we just love the music and. Um, and and we hope probably just we probably bring a little bit of ourselves into it as well, which we'd like to think that Tom would dig, you know, like I think if Tom was alive, I think uh, and he really would, probably wouldn't love. I don't know if he'd love a tribute band that just tried to completely imitate him. And uh, I think he'd probably rather like bands that bring a little bit of their own interpretation to his music. Sadly, in 2017, Tom Petty passed away. 
It's almost been five years since that sad day, and yet his music lives on. For the band Hard Promises, part of their work now is to keep the flame of Petty and the Heartbreakers music as light as possible. That's being done by authentically playing his music and by making an effort to connect with and pass down his music to younger generations. And they plan to play the music as long as the demand is there. Plus, if you get to a show, you'll be guaranteed a party. A lot of it's just showing up because, I mean, you could be my son. You're old enough to be my son. My, I have, my twins are two years younger than you. Okay. So all my kids, I have four kids. They all know every single song, every Beatles song, every Stone song, everything. Cause they grew up in the house, just like you just alluded to with, with classic rock um, intermingled with all of the, their contemporary bands that they listen to that all their friends listen to it's just all one big pot of music it's actually pretty fascinating because we see a lot of younger people at our shows like yourself and it's actually you know at some point i'm like how do they know this song you know (laughs) and it's it's the the answer is obvious it's because their mother or father played it for them or grandmother or whatever um, or or it was in a or it was in a movie. Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> a lot of them hear these songs from from movies, uh, from great soundtracks and movies, and yeah, uh, they Quentin they Tarantino. they don't. That's the only place they know where it's from. They're like, oh, you played that song from Blades of Glory. We're like, no, that's Stroke by Billy Squire. That was actually yeah. a song before it, before it was in a Will Ferrell movie. But uh, <laughs> but it's it's it, you know it it is it's great that that music. Is still in movies and still around and still in it's even in advertisements you know usually it's for a for a medicine but <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> the ed ads <laughs> yeah we i thought for a while that we should do a medley of all the songs from from pharmaceutical ads for our audience because that's about <laughs> the right age um but do it with the actual pharmacies like they change the name to have the medicine in it and we should just do it straight like that <laughs> <laughs> but on the other token, uh, Colin, uh, we gladly jump at the chance, but we don't have an agent that's out there pushing this stuff for us. We, we probably need one, <laughs> but it, you know, it, honestly, we, we are at no loss for gigs. So I suppose if we were at a loss for gigs, we probably would get an agent and start pushing for this kind of stuff. But it's, you know, we're, we're absolutely happy to do this because it's, it's fun and it's, it, it's a great vehicle to get who we are out to the masses. You know, it's, what's kind of funny is that we were, when we were in Kane, Kane was a, was a pretty big band, had a pretty big following in town, Syracuse for sure. I got a little stressed out by the whole thing towards the end. And that was one of the reasons why I told everybody I had to go. I couldn't, couldn't do it anymore. And it was actually Pete Levanti, who was one of the orig- original members of Hard Promises, who was also in Kane. He was a, he was their original drummer in Hard Promises, who gave me a call and said, look, I know you don't want to be in something like Kane anymore, but, you know, why don't we go do something different? Why don't we keep Hard Promises going and do this? And I said, no, I, I don't want I don't want the stress of all that. And he goes, no, 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 we'll just do it small. We'll just do like, you know, we'll play like a little bar in Syracuse called Shifties. We'll just play little bars. That's right. Hard Promises with the Shifty shout out. I know all of you Syracuse folks love that. Love Where we just walk in, set up, and you know, 30 people show up, and it's just truly for fun. We'll have some beer, we'll relax, we'll enjoy the music together, and that'll be it. And I'm like, oh, that, that, that actually sounds the opposite of Kane. That sounds great. And you know, it just kind of naturally grew very quickly into something far bigger than we had originally planned. Um, and that's true of the Tom Petty tribute side of it as well, because yeah. we started... You mentioned the palace, but we actually started at doing that at the um, Dinosaur Barbecue in Syracuse, which is a very famous barbecue restaurant. But um, and uh, but they had an upstairs that was small. It, I think it I think 200 or 220 was capacity 220, yeah. and uh, and a small stage. We could barely fit on it. 
And we said, well, let's try it there and let's just see if anybody wants to see this. And so that was the first Petty Fest and uh, it sold out, you know, and it was sweaty and hot and it was like a, it felt like a frat party. It was fun. Um, so I wish you had experienced that because we were dripping wet. The crowd was dripping wet and uh, it was a party. And we did that for a few years there before we moved it to the palace. Um, so things just kind of grew like that for us. And, and it wasn't really planned. Uh, it wasn't planned. It was just that the musical selection we were choosing, whether it was Petty or whether it was the classic rock mix, got people to want to come out and see us. I think hopefully it had something to do with our musicianship, but I think obviously we didn't write these songs, but we, we, we tried to throw every, we still do. We try to throw a party, you know, I mean, that's the only thought when I write the set list, that's the only thought that I put into it is what song goes well into the next song and how do I build this block of three or four songs into a frenzy? And then how do I get out of it? You know, so it's because we can't go any higher than that. And how do I, you know, what comes after that? And, and how do we make the time go by really fast for everybody and make them feel like they got a great soundtrack going on for their party. And I think that just kind of happened very naturally. It, it was not a, uh, not intentional. And now we have so much work that literally we're, we're kind of in a phase where we're working really hard to learn to say no to sure. things because yeah. it's, it's, we're, Kevin and I are, are generally people who like to say yes to things and, and uh, like to please people. So it's hard to be that person who gets the call and has to say no um, to things that are great, great opportunities, but we've got to, we've got to take care of ourselves too and do it, make sure we're still doing it for the right reasons. Yeah. And we don't we don't want to overstay our welcome either. You know, there's there's a point of diminishing returns where people just get tired of bands. Um, yeah, we've seen that in Syracuse a lot. But in a town like Syracuse, there is a, a shelf life. And we didn't expect to get to the level we are in terms of the opportunities we have to play and the crowds we get to play in front of. But we know that that at some point that will go the other way. And, and we've already kind of made a path to that when we see that happening, we would gladly step aside and be grateful for the time we had there. Not maybe stop playing completely, but we will uh, back it way off to the point where we're truly only doing it when we really, when we really want to do it and let other bands have their opportunity in the limelight. too. When it comes down to it, the members of Hard Promises are fans of music, just like any one of us. And you know, the thing about that we don't didn't talk about is that as much as we like playing, Kevin and I like listening to music. <laughs> we like going to concerts just as much as playing. I mean, I, and so that's something we're really trying hard to fit into. I, you know, there's some great concerts that come around here of people that we won't get to see much longer, unfortunately. And uh, as, as we have some great gigs in June, some really big, we're playing headlining Taste of Syracuse on Friday night. And we're excited about that. But I have to tell you that the very next night on Saturday night, Paul McCartney's coming to the Dome, and uh, honestly, I'm pretty damn excited to see Paul McCartney on Saturday night. So, I mean, that's a hell of a weekend. I'm happy with the combination, but I, I wouldn't have missed uh, Paul McCartney for the world, and the Doobie Brothers with Michael McDonald, they're coming here in, in June as well. I mean, that's, who thought we'd get to see that, you know, that's just, yeah. so we're, we're, we're music lovers. I just came back, Kevin knows, I just came back from a trip to New York to see a band I love, not a hugely popular band, but they had some hits in their day. And I just love their music named Delamitri. And uh, I literally drove to New York, down to New York to be able to see them play after they haven't been in America in 25 years. So we love music, not just making it, but we love listening to really great music. So I hope some of those don't go away. Last year, James Taylor and Jackson Brown came here and played. I, you know, they were, they were fantastic, but you know that Father Time is, is, is ticking and they won't want to come out and or won't be able to come out and play for us anymore so it's thrilling to hear it on the radio and to hear you know the live versions of it playing uh, on your stereo or whatever but it's also thrilling to be in the moment in a concert where you you can hear a song that you love live and honestly it doesn't really matter who's as long as they're playing it well and are faithful to the song, it doesn't matter what, you know, most people don't care. Sounds the same. You know, there are some exceptions. I'll, I'll mention Get the Let Out. I don't know if you've seen Get the Let Out, Colin, but they're, yeah. um, it, you know, they're, in my opinion, and not to piss off anybody, but in my opinion, they are 
the very best Led Zeppelin uh, tribute band out there. But they're not really a tribute band. They're very interesting in the way they do it. They're not trying to imitate, much like we don't, they're not trying to imitate Zeppelin on stage. The guy in the middle doesn't try to be Robert Plant, although he does look like he's from that era. Um, <laughs> but there's other guys that don't look like that. And they come off and say they have nine people, I believe, in the band. And at any uh -huh. given time, it could be four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine on stage, depending on the song. And they make it clear that all they're trying to do is give you the experience of the album that you used to love on stage uh, with no uh, tracks, no, no fake tracks going on. Everything is real. They draw really, really well. They do draw... You know, they'll play a two, three, four thousand seat place and pretty much sell it out. Now, yeah, that's yeah. not compared. If Zeppelin got back together, you know, miraculously, they would obviously sell out Wembley. So um, it's not going to be that big. But bands that do it really well and set themselves apart um, or the bigger bands that people will never get to see again. I think there is a market for that. Um, but you got to be you got to be the you got to be the best. And that takes a lot of time and dedication. And then they're relentless when i'm a spectator more often than not than not the uh, the hair on the back, back of my neck is standing up on <laughs> yeah. certain songs and i just oh, yeah. get you know it's the emotion of of just watching somebody play a song that means so much to you yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a thrill and so the music of tom petty and the heartbreakers lives on through hard promises all through syracuse and the surrounding areas you can hear the band this upcoming year, and they even have a surprise fall petty fest that they are going to announce soon. So please make sure to support your local musicians and go experience the party that is Hard Promises, playing the beautiful music of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. For Colin Cernelia, this has been a Cernig production. Thank you to Jeff Gordon and Kevin Farrell for their time on the podcast, and special thanks to the whole Hard Promises crew for the memories they create for us fans. Thank you for listening. We can put a cherry on top and enjoy the ice cream. Until next time, take it easy. Am I allowed to drink beer on here? Is this a problem? You're allowed to do okay. whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are no we rules. On my We've been trying to get a sponsorship deal, haven't we, Kevin, for a long time for Mick Ultra? Yeah, been, yeah. yeah. We, they said, they tell us we sell the most Mick Ultra in, in this whole area region, but they won't give us a, a sponsorship. <laughs> <laughs> well, when this goes viral, then they'll That they'll would be great. Yeah, we'd yeah. love it. <laughs>